Hello, once again, this is Mr. Smith, and I'm here with you for the Government 2 Politics in America unit. This is the first lecture for the academic class. First of all, the Politics in America is mostly contained within the major two-party system. A political party is a team seeking control of governing by gaining office in an election. That's important to remember, they have to get elected first before they can control the governing process. The parties can be thought of in three parts. There's the electorate, the actual people voting, the organization itself, and then whatever it does with the actual government. Some of the tasks that the parties have is that it's a linkage institution which channels people's concerns into political issues. They pick candidates, they run campaigns, they give cues or hints to voters about which way issues are going, what kind of laws could go into place. They articulate policies, so they come up with the actual laws that will create programming or budget items, and they coordinate policy making to make sure that everyone from their party that is elected to office is actually on the same page. Often the parties can seem combative and argumentative. They don't get really a lot done, but they do bring an important balance. One party says yes, one party says no, they come to a compromise somewhere in between. One party says spend, one party says don't, they come to some kind of compromise in between. So they are important to finding an actual balance. Both parties, of course, have local organizations at the county, sometimes even municipal level. The 50 state party system, each of the states controls, each of the state parties controls their own organization. They try to limit access in some cases by having closed primaries, which means that only voters within the party can participate. Some do have open primaries though, which dilutes the party influence of the average person that is an actual member. National party organizations have national conventions every four years where delegates are picked to go to a certain location where they choose a presidential ticket and the party's platform. The Democrats and Republicans both have a national committee that keeps the party operating between conventions and a national chairperson that is responsible for day-to-day -day activities. Here you can see a picture of one of the conventions happening. They're usually very crowded. Or organizational efforts that are focused on patriotism and what exactly the party wants to do in the way of making policy for the government. Historically, we can trace our roots back to a bifurcated system where there's at least two organizations to the pre-revolutionary period when there were loyalists who wanted to stay with England and patriots that wanted to revolt. There's always a group of people that are neutral, that don't favor either side, but we usually break ourselves up into two different groups. When the Constitution was written, we had Federalists that favored creating a strong central government and Anti-Federalists that opposed creating favored states. And both of those groups created propaganda, which is something that parties do. Madison and the other founding fathers warned of political parties, though, believing they would just lead to divisiveness, and to some extent that is true. In the early Republic, once the Constitution was passed, there would be two groups of people, the Federalists, which would follow John Quincy at, or John John Adams, excuse me, uh, George Washington would be neutral. The Federalists like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton wanted a loose interpretation of the Constitution, also known as loose constructionism. They also believed in a strong central government, and they included people like Chief Justice Marshall. Even though George Washington stayed neutral, he often would side with the Federalists when it came to government policy. On the right is Thomas Jefferson, and he was considered the de facto ruler of the Democratic Republicans, also known as the Jeffersonian Republicans. They believed the Constitution should be strictly interpreted, literally, word for word, and that government should have a lot of power. Instead, most of the power should go to the states and the common man, and the common man should have rights. Eventually, the Federalist Party would fall out of favor. John Adams would lose re-election, Thomas Jefferson would win twice, and the Democratic Republican Party or Jeffersonian Republican Party would become increasingly popular. Uh, probably sealing the deal for the Federalists would be the fact that during the War of 1812 they opposed it because many of them lived in New England and thought it would harm their shipping businesses. And so from the picture on the left, many of them met in Hartford, 
Connecticut in order to decide whether or not they should secede from the Union. Obviously, they decided not to, but this looked traitorous, and eventually the Federalist Party ended up dying. After it died, we entered what was known as the Era of Good Feelings, where there was only one party, the Democratic-Republican Party, and president after president belonged to this party. Uh, but the problem is when you have one big party, either it becomes incredibly controlling in order to stay in power in an authoritarian manner, or it is so big and includes so many opinions it seems chaotic, and that's what happened in the case of the United States. In 1824, too many people ran for president at the same time, and so because of that, no one got an electoral majority. And whenever that happens, the House of Representatives gets to choose the president, and the Senate gets to choose the vice president. The Speaker of the House at the time, Henry Clay, would convince the body to give the election to John Quincy Adams, even though less people voted for him. This, the reason why we're talking about this from a political perspective, is it made Andrew Jackson and his supporters incredibly angry, so they broke off and formed their own separate Democratic Party. The Adams supporters would eventually become called the Whig Party, which is spelled W-H-I-G-S. Andrew Jackson set up this modern-day Democratic Party. In fact, it is the oldest formal political party in the world. There were other political parties that existed before that, but... They actually had an organizational structure and leadership and propaganda and volunteers and employees. This party machine, as it would be called, would organize heavily in cities. It would hire workers to promote the party and distribute pamphlets. They also emphasized, once again, the idea of supporting the common man. And because of this, Jackson won in 1828, proving that the Democratic Party would be a formidable force. Meanwhile, Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams would be leaders of the Whig Party, which believed in nationalism in a sense that the nation needed a strong binding together through a system of roads, canals, and then eventually railroads in order to improve trade. And this was, of course, expensive and required a lot of taxes, so Jackson was often opposed to these types of efforts. What eventually caused both parties' problems would be the split over slavery. The Whigs in the South and North just couldn't agree, so eventually the party split. The Northern Whigs eventually joined with the Free Soil Party to make up what was called the Republican Party, running for their first candidate for president in 1856. The Democrats stayed together, but once again there was too many disagreements. The more conservative Democrats in the South favored keeping slavery, while those in the North maybe weren't opposed to it, but... They believed that slavery shouldn't spread, and they didn't really want to make slavery the biggest issue in their election campaigns. This would eventually, of course, cause there to be three candidates that either were Democrats or have been Democrats running from the Democratic Party for president in 1860, dividing the vote and giving the election to Abraham Lincoln. During the Civil War and afterwards, during Reconstruction, the Republican Party was incredibly powerful and was able to get a lot done. The Democratic Party was incredibly weak. Many of them left it with the South during the Civil War and afterwards, when the South was returned into the Union, many of them weren't allowed to vote or run for office for a period of time. And eventually, though, once 1876 came along, in that election year, there was once again no one getting a majority of the electoral vote because of some disputed electors. So Congress decided to put together a commission, and they ended up awarding the election to Rutherford B. Hayes. Now, supposedly a secret deal was made that he agreed that troops would be withdrawn finally from the South and Reconstruction would end. But this, of course, meant the Democratic Party could come back full force. And so they would dominate the South, the Republicans would dominate the North and West, and whenever you dominate like that and have no competition, you form what is basically a monopoly, and you stop trying as hard. So both parties became a little lazy and corrupt, and that brought about the Gilded Age. After Reconstruction ended, the parties became friends of monopolies and trusts. It led to corruption, bribery, and graft, where you arrange government projects to profit off of them. And so many smaller th parties started to get angry about this, and they formed and started winning small local elections and some state elections. That would include the Populist Party, also known as the People's Party. It would include the Prohibition Party, eventually the Socialist Party, and so on. 
And so the Democrats and Republicans started to get worried about these smaller parties. And so they decided to take some of their ideas, especially promoting eventually women's suffrage and reforming the government with through the civil service system and also inter- or sponsoring amendments like the 17th Amendment, which would allow the direct election of senators, which hadn't happened before because they had been appointed by the state governments. And so lots of different reform measures would be introduced. Prohibition, of course, would be passed with the 18th Amendment, but that, of course, led to organized crime and lots of people breaking the law. And eventually it was repealed by the 21st Amendment. So the Prohibition Party got its main goal through. It just wasn't able to keep a hold of it. And, of course, the 19th Amendment allowed the women's suffrage or the right to vote, which would pass eventually after Democrat Woodrow Wilson came out in favor of it, even though the president technically doesn't have anything to do with constitutional amendments. And so many of these changes basically went from third parties into the two bigger parties. Socialists and populists favored workers' rights and opportunities for the poor, so they were generally backed by labor unions. But once again, Democrats and Republicans started to take these ideas. So prohibition, women's suffrage, labor unions, conservation of the environment, all of these became big topics. Eventually, we entered then what was called the progressive era when all these reforms were being made. And so one of the most popular progressives was Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, inherited the office when William McKinley was assassinated and then he ran for his own term. And even though he wasn't elected twice, he thought that was enough and he didn't want to break George Washington's tradition of two terms in office. So he ended up bowing out and backing his cabinet secretary, William Taft, to become president of the United States. But shortly afterwards, after Taft got elected, he became disappointed and thought Taft wasn't progressive enough, although that's debatable. And so eventually Teddy Roosevelt would run trying to steal the Republican nomination from him. And that would fail. And so he ended up running as a third party candidate known as a progressive or a bull moose because he was as strong as a bull moose. Uh, But this ended up dividing the Republican vote. Many Republicans then voted for this third party candidate of Teddy Roosevelt which ended up splitting the election and getting Woodrow Wilson to win in 1912. But that brought about World War I. The government got more involved in international affairs. The government got more involved in the economy. And so after Woodrow Wilson is done with his second term, Warren Harding runs basically saying he wants the country to return to the way it was and to a sense of normalcy. And so he basically takes the Republican Party away from progressivism to some extent and promote smaller government, lower taxes, less regulation. And this took place throughout the 20s, which caused enormous economic growth, but then also led to an enormous economic crash. And that is what caused FDR and the New Deal to come about. People were disappointed with the conservative Republicans of the time, and so a New Deal coalition formed around FDR to support him. And included Southerners who were still conservative, but they hated Abraham Lincoln, who had been dead for a long time, so they continued to vote Democrat. Eastern and Southern European immigrants who, who had already experienced economic hardship and didn't want to see it anymore. Unions who wanted increased protection for the right to protest and strike and boycott. Also, other immigrants from Europe, including Jews who had been persecuted. African-Americans had voted Republican because it had been the party of Lincoln, but they liked FDR's economic ideas because they had, in fact, been impacted more than almost every other group by the Great Depression. FDR also believed in hiring experts and promoting public education, so what was known as the intelligentsia or the educated elite also supported FDR. And so this new New Deal coalition helped get him elected and helped Democrats overwhelmingly win both the Senate and House. Now, with FDR and the New Deal, he promoted more government intervention, bigger government, which required more taxes and borrowing. All of these moved the party more toward the progressive or liberal side. So the Democrats went from being conservative to liberal, and the Republicans went from being a little bit of a mix, more progressive under Teddy Roosevelt, to the conservative side under Warren Harding. Because of this New Deal coalition, though, the Democrats would win the White House most of the time between 1932 and 1968, with the exception of Eisenhower. And they would control Congress most of the time between 1930 and 1994, with the exception of the Senate being taken a couple of times here and there. 
the Republicans would eventually face a crossroads because even though they had gone conservative, they still had this small progressive wing inside it. And in 1960, that would change with, or 1964, that would change with the nomination of Barry Goldwater, an extremely conservative senator who believed in keeping government as small as possible and keeping taxes as low as possible. He thought racism was wrong and segregation was wrong, but once again, he didn't think that was the government's business. He thought the government should let the people handle those types of situations. This caused him and the Republican Party to take enormous loss in the 1964 election with LBJ winning most of the counties and states in the entire country with over 60% of the vote. So many people thought that extreme conservatism was dead, but that would not be true because Barry Goldwater had an apprentice, kind of, who would eventually become governor of California and then president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. And so when Reagan was elected in 1980, he said basically the same thing. Taxes are too high. We have too many laws now governing all kinds of things like pollution and education and highways. We need to cut back on some of these things and decrease the size of the government. And so Reagan made the party more conservative, and he was successful at it. He won twice in 1980 and 1984, and he was so popular that his vice president, George H.W. Bush, or Bush the Elder, won in 1988. And that forever changed the Republican Party. The Republican Party supported small government, except when it came to the Defense Department. They wanted a big military in order to win the Cold War. They disliked big taxes in government, and they wanted to make America to be proud again because the 70s were troubling and depressing with Vietnam and Watergate, and they wanted to focus on America's greatness once again. In response to that, eventually the Democrats nominated more of a centrist person, so not too liberal, and that would be Bill Clinton, who would bring the party to a central point to compete with the Republicans. He would cut taxes for the middle class. He would tone down support for abortion and gays. He used the military to help protect the people of Kosovo, which is just north of Greece, to protect them from persecution. He would also start the program as welfare to work, encouraging people using welfare benefits to get at least a part-time job. And he would balance the budget, having a surplus, bringing in more money that they spent for one of the first times in quite a few generations. Competing with him would be the Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, who, of course, would lead to the impeachment or charge of the president, although the president was not convicted in the Senate and he was not removed from office. Uh, but this created a lot of personal animosity between the two and increased the amount of mudslinging or negative political attacks that were happening in American politics. And Newt Gingrich also believed that, just like Barry Goldwater in 1964, that being conservative meant not compromising as much and sticking to your guns and so this, of course, would also start to create more of a divide inside politics. Just a couple of generations before that, there at least were some progressives in both parties, and there's some reaching across the aisle, but 1990s and when that would start to decrease. And this, of course, would lead to eventual change with the election of President Barack Obama, increasing on the changing demographics of the country. The Democrats would focus more on African Americans and those that are Latino, uh, but also new groups of people, especially those of various ethnic minorities. They would also eventually embrace things like gay marriage, for instance. And that would increase support against LGBTQ community as well. And because of that, the Democrats keeping hold of some other people like union members, for instance, and college educated, and this combination would allow them to win two, two presidential elections. Although, even though they won those in 2008 and then again in 2012, their share of state and local elections started to go down, which continues continued to be a problem for the Democratic Party. And then, of course, there's Donald Trump. He would be the reaction to this, basically saying that all these trade deals that both Republicans and Democrats have been doing have been harmful to America. And even though there were unions, they weren't really helping working class enough. And so he decided that being a business owner, he would be able to help fix all of these problems in the United States. And so this type of populism that we saw at the end of the 19th century that began with the progressive movement actually helped infuse 
President Trump into office. Now, the question is, he's going to get some of the things Republicans used to be in the past. He went back toward their isolationist tone, which they had since the 1920s with Warren Harding, but that goes against what George W. Bush did with the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. And so that, the, the question is, after President Trump leaves office, what will happen to the Republican Party? Will they go back toward supporting using the military in lots of different places, or will they stay isolationist? Will they go against free trade deals, or will they promote more deals that end up protecting American workers? It's hard to say what exactly will happen after President Trump leaves office. The Republican Party today, in the meantime, typically favors family values of Christian Judean descent, particularly they are pro-life or opposed to abortion and favor traditional marriage. They believe in low taxes and that many of them would like low taxes to also be equal so everyone pays the same percentage. They also believe in smaller government, and if there is any governing done, it needs to be done at the state and local level, so they favor the system of federalism strongly. But they still believe in having a big military. They're pro-Second Amendment, and they're popular in the Midwest, South, and rural areas. And the Democratic Party is pro-choice. They favor, of course, gay marriage. They believe the government should be used to create economic opportunity pay back civil rights. They are internationalists favoring the use of organizations like the United Nations. And they believe taxes should be progressive and heavier for the rich. They are popular on the West Coast, the Great Lakes region, the Northeast, and urban areas.